The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Order, order. I call Marsha de Cordova to move the motion. Thank you. I beg to move that this House has considered e-petition 
61300 and 61725 relating to the cost of living and financial support for disabled people. Um, it is my pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Sir Robert, and I also want to begin um, by congratulating Rachel Curtis and Abigail Blomfield and Katie Stiles for creating this petition. Abigail and Katie are here today and over 40,000 people have signed their petition. I would also like to put on record my thanks to the committee staff for all their work, Inclusion London and Disability Rights UK for meeting me last week and the many organisations that sent through briefings and provided advice including Oxfam, Scope, MenCap, the RNIB and Citizens Advice. Ahead of today's debate, the Petitions Committee launched a survey with 10,854 people completed it. One of the biggest responses to a Petition Committee survey. Now, the plight of disabled people, <clears throat> people should concern every member as the proportion of the UK population reporting a disability has risen to 20%, which is more over the last decade. And as a disabled person myself, I know how enormously intensive it can be to share your story. So I want to thank each and every one of those people that completed that survey and thank them for sharing their experience. In response to the ongoing cost of living um, emergency uh, and cost of living energy crisis, 93% of respondents have had to limit their use of energy. 76% are limiting their use of transport and 60% have limited their use of specialist equipment. And half, over half have had to reduce the use of medication. Now these results are shocking. Unsurprisingly, testimonies of poor mental health were apparent and some described feelings of despair. Others even report of being pushed to consider suicide. One respondent wrote that, my life is hard. I survived childhood cancer to become a disabled adult. I had so many hopes for my life, but now each day I regret not dying of cancer. My life is not dignified. A mother wrote, my son is allergic to the cold. He has EPI pens and I have had to use them this winter, as I haven't had to use, been able to use them this winter, as I can't afford the heating to have it on all the time, or I can't afford special clothing for him. I feel like I have failed him as a mother. A person who, regret, who regrets not dying of cancer, a mother who feels like she is a failure. I want to ask the minister, how is it acceptable in the UK in 2023? Nearly half of those living in poverty in the UK are disabled or live with somebody who is disabled. Yes, I will. She's making a very, very strong and powerful speech. Um, and she's absolutely right uh, in terms of the figures around poverty. One in three uh, disabled people will, will be living in poverty, twice that of non-disabled people. And whilst I absolutely applaud the petition and, and the aims, and uh, um, particularly the, the call for one-off payments um, as a temporary measure, does she agree with me that the real issue is about the adequacy of social, support, uh, social security support for disabled pay people, which has been absolutely emaciated over the last 12 years? And does she agree as well that we need to really incorporate the UN Convention, the rights of... Uh, of disabled people into <coughs> law were a signatory and have been since 2009, uh, but we are failing, particularly in providing adequate social, social protection, as they call it. Yeah. And can I thank my honourable friend for her intervention? She is absolutely spot on. We need a wholesale review of social security, but more important, we need the government should commit, as has Labour, to fully incorporating the UN Convention on the rights of disabled people, so we are protecting their, their civil and human rights. Now, it is a fact that disabled people incur extra costs, and the latest disability price tag report by Scope found that the average disabled household faces £975 a month in extra costs, 
with the figure rising to over £1,200 if accommodating the inflationary costs for this period, 2022 to 23. The, the, the Resolution Foundation found that the gap in household income between adults with and without a disability was 30%. That includes disability social security, and it rises to 44 when it does not, and that was across the period of 2020 to 2021. Now, citizens advice data for May 2023 this year shows that since quarter one of 2022, the largest cohort helped were either permanently sick or disabled. Now, the Trust or Trust has reported that disabled people are hugely overrepresented in food poverty demographics. Now, 73% of families that took part in the recent survey by the Disabled Char Children's Partnership said that the cost of living crisis will have a significant impact on their disabled children. Now, disabled household spending, a partic spending is particularly exposed to, ongoing energy, to the ongoing energy crisis, given that energy bills for medical issues spreading on spending on specialist equipment and food make up a disproportionate share of all spending. Now, in response to the committee survey, 48% said that they had extra costs due to the use of specialist equipment. Now, the blame lies, there's no question in my view, that the blame does lie with, the, with successive years of Conservative government, where they have created a hostile environment for disabled people. Now, this is compounded by the pandemic and this current cost of living crisis. The government support has barely scratched the surface. The poultry support is woefully insufficient and the very definition of what we would call sticking plaster politics. 80% of disabled people surveyed receiving the £150 cost of living payment said it would not be enough to cover their increased costs for the essentials. It begs the question, how does the government think the payment will be sufficient when inflation is around 10%, and official figures show the fastest annual increases in food and drink prices in inflation in the last 40 years at around 19% as of March this year. Now, the reality, is e the reality is even cost of living payments aren't always reaching people. For instance, those on the New Start ESA who do not qualify for any government cost of living payment support. Now, there is also the cruel decision to change the warm homes discount criteria during the cost of living crisis, despite the government's own impact assessment finding that 290,000 disabled people would no longer receive the warm homes discount. So for them, that £150 disability cost of living payment only offsets the loss of the warm homes discount. Why? What's more worrying is that the government hasn't provided specific support for disabled households incurring high energy costs. Now, many disabled people have told me that it is pointless to prescribe medicine if a person can't afford to run the equipment to stay alive. Now, NHS schemes in place to cover the electricity costs of oxygen concentrators and dialysis machines are currently beset with issues. And the Retail Energy Code Company has argued for establishing a service tailored for those using medical equipment. Now, on prepayment meters, 60% of the people the system's advice supported between January 2022 and February 2023 who couldn't afford to top up their prepayment meters were disabled. And this is compared to 40% who were not or didn't have a long-term health condition. Now, UK household energy suppliers have now agreed to a new code of practice, um, meaning that they will only be able to force fit prepayment meters <laughs> subject to a set of um, voluntary restric restrictions. Um, but we all know the industry needs to go further by banning uh, prepayment meters for disabled people and providing more help with energy debt. And so why won't the government call on an industry-wide ban to, force, to stop the forcing of these installations in disabled households. Now, the political choices of austerity has gutted our social security system, and there are real consequences to this. 
Government-funded research suggests that cuts to social care, health and public health cause, has caused more than 57,500 deaths in England than that would have been expected in spend, if spending had continued um, at pre-2010 trends. Now, in the long overdue health and disability white paper, there is now an increased focus on getting disabled people into work and a ramping up of the use of sanctions. Now, the government should actually be focusing on improving schemes like access to work and getting rid of all those delays and dealing with all of the outstanding applications. It is one of the best kept mechanisms for support for disabled people, especially those that are living with sight loss, to help and to also retain and stay in work. Now, evidence suggests that there is little evidence um, that sanctions actually do work um, and they do have a negative impact um, on the health of disabled people. The White Paper seeks to scrap, or well, rightly, I would say, seeks to scrap the work cap capability assessment, but replacing it with the personal independence payment assessment is absurd, given that PIP is, has a totally different function as it serves as an extra cost benefit, despite it not actually meeting all of those additional costs. The PIP assessment framework, as we all know, and we've all debated in this place, is flawed, and the level of support offered in many cases is inadequate. The government's own statistics show that over 60% of PIP decisions um, that are appealed are overturned in favour of the claimant. Well, the government has never carried out an assessment on the adequacy of PIP and whether it is fit for purpose. So will they commit to an assessment on its adequacy and whether it actually does work um, and seek to make improvements to the assessment? There is also the issue of social care charges. Now, disabled people who receive social care can be asked to give up to 40% of their social security income to pay for social care. Now, this will leave many, and it does leave many, in deep poverty and forces them to make impossible choices between meeting the basic needs such as heating or eating and essential care. And research by the BBC found that over 60,000 people were in social care debt. Now, there are clear actions the government could take to address this situation. The government must increase the disability cost of living payment and frankly, they should be making those payments now. I have no understanding as to why people are having to wait till June before they receive that second payment. And it should extend the cost of living payments to everybody, especially those on New Start ESA, and bring in the universal credit uplift and remove the social security benefit cap. It must also reverse changes to the eligibility criteria for the warm homes discount. The government could also push the energy industry to bring in an energy debt waiver or some sort of social tariff. Now, we know a social tariff, however it is designed, is very unlikely to meet the needs of disabled people in isolation. Therefore, such a tariff should instead be developed alongside a tailored cost support policy. The government also should look at the feasibility of the warm homes prescription Aiming, aiming to help people with both low incomes and severe health conditions made worse by bad weather. Energy, energy suppliers must also improve access to information for disabled people, especially blind and partially sighted people and those with a learning disability, as it is their legal duty to do so. So what pressure can the government apply to them to ensure that they are compliant? Now, the changes outlined in the white paper are also designed to get more disabled people into work, but how is the government removing barriers for disabled people to actually access the labour market, including addressing the disability employment and pay gap, with disabled people on average being paid 21% less than their non-disabled colleagues? There also needs to be, as my honourable friend has outlined, there needs to be changes to the social security system to make it less cruel and unfair and hostile and restore it to its original purpose, which was to provide a safety net for those in need. Disabled people are not asking for more, they are asking for equity. The government should be ashamed that disabled people are dying or reporting that they want to commit suicide. This really should be a bit of a watershed moment for the government today. Many are angry and frustrated, feeling that the government has abandoned them, and it's letting 
them down, the very people it really should be seeking to protect the most. An, exa and an example of this was the long overdue or late national disability strategy, which was ruled unlawful last a few years back. And many of us didn't believe it was credible in the first place, but what has, have they replaced it with? There needs to be fun a fundamental rethink and change in, in the approach the government has to take when it comes to serving uh, disabled people. It really must be about making their lives better and not about causing preventable harm. So once again, as I close, I want to thank the petitioners and those members that are here this afternoon, um, encourage you to maybe say hi hello to Abigail and Katie um, after this debate. I had the opportunity of meeting them last week and hearing their experiences as well as to what drew them to actually starting this petition was pretty harrowing. And as I say, I really do hope today can be a moment where the government can acknowledge um, their flaws and their failures on the part of disabled people and seek to draw a line and bring about changes that will improve their lives. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 610300 and 61745 relating to the cost of living and financial support for disabled people. Paul Maynard. Thank you, Sir under your chairmanship and to follow the Honourable Member for Battersea and indeed to have a second bite of the cherry to speak on this topic given I couldn't make the Honourable Member for Motherwell's uh, debate last Monday. So always good to have a second coming, I have to say, although in my case perhaps not. We've had another quint debate, I think, so far. We will, I'm sure, hear many, many numbers uh, during the course of this debate. Two stick out to me that I will quote. One is from Kidney Care UK, who cites the average annual extra cost to an individual facing dialysis as being £1,918. The second big figure that I will cite is from the charity Contact a Family, who work with disabled children. They say that the average cost of the energy needs of their disabled children amounts to £1,596, covering such matters as uh, pumps, monitors, hoists, uh, electric wheelchairs, all of those are related to an individual's health condition. So that's one type of extra costs the disabled face in regards to their energy needs. The second type isn't really a health need, but is a consequence of their disability. I chair the Augmentive and Assistive Technology, or part of group, ATEC for short. This is why many people with quite profound often and severe disabilities, particularly in cerebral palsy, rely upon computer aids or some sort of IT aids to engage with the wider world. It's vital to their quality of life. These can be um, voice recognition software, eyeball control software, and so on. All of that relies upon electricity. That, of course, costs money as well. It's a consequence of their disability, but not an actual health need per se. Then, of course, there's the third sort, which is for those with any sort of disability, the need to maintain your, war, your home at a higher temperature than might otherwise be the case, merely to keep you warm. And to that end, can I just give a small plug to my Westminster Hall debate at, half, at four o'clock, I think, or half past four, I'll need to check which, on Wednesday, which is about furniture poverty and affordability, which is all about one area I will focus on, is the fact that in social housing, all too often, new tenants find they move in and the floor coverings have been removed. They can't afford to then replace them. They end up with a much less well-insulated property, which will, for many of them, affect their health. So those are three areas that I think we need to consider particularly. And reading the Hansard from the debate last week and noting it in questions and reading it online in preparation for this debate, a consensus does seem to be emerging. We hear the phrase social tariff cropping up time and time and time again. Lots of discussion on personal independence payments and what role they play, recognising the £150 the government has made available. But also a lot of talk around the lump sum that we see in this petition of £650. There are positives and negatives about all of those, in my view. I am interested always in how personal independence payment works. I think it clearly has an important role to play, designed to meet additional costs 
that people face with a disability in their day-to-day -day lives. And there's always a long-term debate over the extent to which it fulfills that goal. You know, um, the purple pound, the extra premium that so many face isn't always reflected in the extent to which PIP meets that goal. But whether a non-means-tested benefit, which PIP is, is the right avenue to support the energy needs of the most vulnerable in society is a debate worth having. We should not automatically assume that PIP is the answer to every problem. If that is the argument, then, you have to ju then members have to justify to me why millionaires should benefit equally to some of my poorest constituents and why I should not get more um, intense and focused support. The second issue is around the social tariff. Social tariffs sound all well and good. Everyone thinks a social tariff is a wonderful idea. A social tariff has to be paid for somewhere. It is a subsidy, very often taken from other bill payers' accounts. So it often ends up on a standing charge. And what we risk doing by a continual focus on solving every problem with a social tariff is it then gets put on the standing charge. And you have this ever-decreasing circle where more and more people will see that standing charges go up have to have cause to uh, revert to a social tariff because they can't afford their bills anymore, thereby increasing the standing charges. Now, in reality, of course, that would not occur. But it is a logical inference. Once again, you cannot keep solving every problem in our energy system and our cost of living crisis by placing them on a standing charge. Other ways have to be found. Now, I accept the intention of the £650 lump payment is a good one. My only point would be that it is an arbitrary figure and it certainly doesn't reflect the overall cost that many of the people I just mentioned uh, experience far and above £650. So I think, well, it's good. I'm not sure that's necessarily the answer either. Now, the member for Battersea briefly made mention to the Retail um, Energy Code Company and their report. I'm going to give it a bit more of a, of a plug-in because I think it's actually much more exciting than the member uh, perhaps suggested it was. Uh, the Retail Energy Code Company actually exists... I'm oh, sorry, you mentioned it only briefly and I just want to give it a bit more because the detail in it is actually quite... Uh, I know I'm, not, uh, I'm not mocking the Honourable Lady at all, I'm just saying I wanted to cover it in a bit more detail because I have the time that I know she didn't because she had to cover much more. So I urge her not to take offence unnecessarily. The Retail Energy Code Company advises energy companies on the code of conduct it must adopt towards its customers. Now, given my, some of my casework, I'm not sure how much the energy companies are listening to it, perhaps, if that's its role in our energy sector. But Andrew Mower, who has been working on them with a set of proposals on how to deal with energy costs for disabled people, I think has done a superb job in exploring this area and perhaps finding some of the flaws in some of the proposals that have been made in uh, recent months. In particular, I think it's worth looking at the NHS schemes that exist at the moment, particularly for those on oxygen concentrators and dialysis machines. Um, it's a perfectly good model. I'm glad to see the NHS recognising that they have to help people meet the energy costs, but it is not universal. It goes back to our old friend, the postcode lottery. In addition, the subsidy doesn't go up when energy prices go up. So therefore, you're always playing catch-up. And thirdly, people are paid in arrears, so they have to stump up the cash to pay their bills in the first place in the hope that they will get the money back at some future date. That money may not actually reflect the actual bill that they have to pay. So it's interesting how that NHS model that we think might be the answer to many things actually causes as many problems as it solves. Similarly, once again, social tariffs. Mr. Moore points out the immense difficulty they have found in the broadband sector by trying to come up with a social tariff that actually works, that doesn't interact with the market in perverse ways with unintended consequences, that sees social tariffs actually costing more than the one that's available on the market to families here and now. So social tariffs by themselves are actually quite difficult to get right and need to be extremely flexible. So I'm not entirely convinced that Ofgem spending hours and hours and hours each week reinventing what this week's social tariffs should look like every time the energy cap changes is actually the answer either. I will, certainly. Thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way and he's very informed and detailed on this topic so I, I defer to his superior knowledge. 
But does he not agree that the Retail Energy Code Company and indeed Ofgem and all of those involved in the market are clearly failing the most vulnerable in our society? Because in my constituency, I have vulnerable and disabled constituents who are turning off their energy just so they can survive. Yet the, the, the disaster of the structure and indeed the point he made about the standing charges means that they're no better off, but they're freezing cold. Well, I share her view as to the reality her constituents and indeed my constituents face. I share some of her criticisms of the energy companies themselves. I think the Retail Energy Co Company maybe is trying to provide an answer that I hope the energy company will listen to. That I hope might just persuade her that they are worth a, a second look. Uh, I don't know. Time will tell, perhaps. Many charities, when they're coming up with their proposals from the disability sector, are emphasising the broadness of eligibility and auto-enrolment. This is entirely logical and sensible for them to do. They have learned from the reality of the priority services register. Well, when I, in, my own, in my own constituency, I find that the people who really ought to be on that priority services register are the least likely to be on it. So they are right to be concerned that some sort of voluntary enrolment would actually get to where we want to go. At the same time, though, what they're missing out, I think, is the potential to have a more tailored scheme. It goes back to the point I made earlier. Everybody's energy costs are going to be different. And having one-off payments, I don't think necessarily meets that challenge. And Mr. Mower... Uh, yeah. yeah, I know, I mean, he's making a very thoughtful speech, actually, about yes. a complex issue. But uh, would you accept that having some money, while imperfect, yes. has to be preferable yes. to being left without that amount of money? Yes. Something is better than nothing, but part of, part of the art of speech making is to build an argument, as I hope she'll understand, and I haven't yet culminated in my argument of what I actually think we should do. So, by all means, criticise whether you agree or disagree with my critique of what is being proposed. I'm about to come on to what I think should be done that I hope might just persuade her yet again. Um, Mr. Mower looks at what they do in Australia, and the states in Australia, who have actually gone into great detail on this. And they've looked at all the different forms of medical equipment that people are using, looked at their energy intensity, because each, each piece of equipment has a different energy consumption rate. It can't just be done by minutes or hours. Some of them are more energy intensive than others. And they have done calculations that enable them the, to ensure that the energy firms are obliged to discount the energy at the point of consumption. There is no need to then... Um, um, either submit a, a request for a rebate from your energy company or some supplementary top-up, it occurs at the point of use of consumption by that energy. And that, I think, helps solve the problem of how we support those with quite intensive equipment needs. What I agree it does not do is meet the needs of those who have to heat their properties generally for their own health benefits. And once again, the Honourable Lady mentioned briefly the issue of the warm homes prescription. Um, which the NHS energy catapult, sorry, the energy uh, systems catapult has been introducing. It's had a very limited run out in Gloucestershire. I think it's now operating in four areas as a pilot. I think that has great potential, but where I would issue some caution is to understand, if we don't yet, is it actually saving the NHS money? The idea is that, you, that one, a social prescriber, uh, looks at a person's energy consumption the insulation in their homes, what their energy needs are, and works out whether a form of prescription to support with energy prices is a way for stalling more expensive treatment for more severe health conditions at some future date. That's quite hard to capture in a short period of time because we haven't seen the long-term consequences yet. But to me, that seems quite, I think, a positive measure. And that would then deal with the issue of people needing to warm their homes over a longer period of time. So you have a twin-track approach. Now, I've tried not to read out verbatim from Mr. Moore's report and put it in my own words, because otherwise that would be a very boring speech to give. But let me quote just from what his conclusion is, which is that the electricity costs of these consumers, i.e. those who are required to rely upon equipment, would best be met through a scheme that can tailor support to the needs of each eligible consumer, rather than a policy targeted at a wider range of vulnerable consumers so that those individuals can have full confidence the costs of their relevant equipment are being met. And that, to me, is the key word in this debate. It is confidence. 
The Honourable Lady mentioned it, some of the interventions mentioned it. The uncertainty of individuals with very severe health conditions who do not have the confidence to continue heating their, their properties, uh, running their equipment, running the risk of disadvantageous health outcomes because they don't have the confidence that they're able to afford to meet their bills. I urge the Minister and the other Minister who is now not here, that was here briefly, to really engage with the Retail Energy Code Company to look at this in great detail, to bring together the NHS and the social prescribing uh, network, and I know social prescribing is always the answer to everything in life these days, but in this case it might just be, who knows, to try to work out with Ofgem whether this twin track approach could actually solve the problem that we're seeking to solve. Thank you. Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Sir Robert. It's a pleasure to speak in this debate with you in the chair, and I do congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Battersea, on leading this important debate. We know that the serious implications of rising prices for fuel, transport and food have fallen much harder on some people. People with disabilities face a higher risk of poverty. The poverty rate for individuals who live in families where someone is disabled is 28%, 9% more than those who live in families where no one is disabled. They are also less likely to be able to make savings on their bills for reasons related to their disability. We just heard a great deal about how um, the, the size of bills impacts on many people. I'm going to talk about one of the petitioners who is here today, Katie Stiles. She is an unpaid carer for her husband who has motor neuron disease, and she's a campaigner for improved support for carers. She put it like this, it's not a question of putting on an extra jumper for us. When someone has a muscle wasting disease, their ability to stay warm is compromised, so homes need to be heated for longer and at higher temperatures. Not heating your home can lead to chest infections, and in turn, this can lead to a stay in hospital. So we're focusing in uh, an awful lot uh, around uh, households for somebody with a disability, but the extra costs for heating are not only borne by the person with a disability, it's also by their unpaid carers. Mm. Well over a quarter of all unpaid carers are living in poverty. And research from Carers UK found that more than three quarters of carers said that the rising cost of living is actually one of the main challenges they would face in 2023. Hardly a surprise, I, good I morning, imagine. Good morning. Yes, indeed. Um, thank you for mentioning my fantastic constituent, Katie Stiles, who's here today. But would she agree with me that campaigns like We Care and people like Katie make a real difference to us because they talk about the impact in their real lives and how all the decisions we make here affect them on a daily basis and it's not just the sort of statistics that we receive from other charities and things but we know how each decision we make here impacts on their real life. Yeah. I, I very much agree and um, I, I have to say Sir Robert it's, it's a very good thing that uh, Katie Stiles is here today as one of the petitioners because I have learned a lot from her um, about the role of carers. Um, it's something that I care very deeply about and like her I would like to see improved support for carers. Um, back to uh, this point about maintaining higher temperatures in the home, of course, um, people with disabilities, as we've heard in so far in this debate, are also being hit with uh, increased costs of other equipment, vital high energy equipment we've heard about, the increased cost of additional laundry and bathing needs has to come into it, mm. and increased transport costs for visits to medical appointments. That can be very, very mm. costly. Um, as my honourable friend said in her opening speech, the charity scope has found that on average households with at least one disabled adult or child need an additional £975 a month to have the same standard of living as households with, uh, without somebody with a disability. And in fact, those extra costs, she gave this figure too, rise to £1,122 a month after accounting for inflation. Mm. I mean, in this debate, we're, we're throwing around amounts of 150 and 650, but I think we should think about those figures mm. because mm. 150 goes nowhere near, does it, mm, exactly. uh, when we think about those increased costs. Yeah, yeah. The petition asks for disabled people and unpaid carers to be included in the one-off 650 cost of living support. And we should really reflect, as I said, on the fact that unpaid carers are more likely to live in poverty than those without caring responsibilities. 29% compared with 20%. Now, the government responded to both petitions for today's debate, stating that 6 million people in receipt of a qualifying disability benefit would receive a £150 payment uh, last September. But only those in receipt of a qualifying benefit would receive the £650 payment. And I understand this excluded... 568,000 personal independent payment and 
and disability living allowance claimants and 523,000 carers allowance claimants. Carers like Katie Stiles and the We Care campaign argue that while the one-off £150 payment was of course welcome, and as we've discussed uh, in the interventions earlier, any amount extra mm. is welcome. But let's be clear about it. In terms of the additional energy costs that disabled uh, people and their families are bearing, it was completely inadequate in the context of the ongoing cost of living crisis. We've all mm. seen our own bills. £150 hardly goes anywhere. Mm. So the We Care campaign does recommend that the government introduces a social tariff for energy, which discounts energy bills for those most in need, automatically enrolls eligible households and is mandatory for all suppliers, as is advocated by Age UK and Scope Charities. I'm afraid, Sir Robert, I'm not going to be able to get into all of the, uh, the ins and outs of, the, of, of the, the, the argument we heard earlier from the Honourable Member opposite. Um, but, you know, clearly, and I do disagree with him to a certain extent about this, I think that uh, it doesn't matter how many hours Ofgem spends mm. on this, Ofgem should be spending time on this because, exactly. you know, it's, it's vital that we have a mm. solution. I just want to, to talk a little bit about, about that work by Age UK. Research earlier by Age UK found that cost of living pressures this winter led, more to, led to more than half of older people cutting back on heat and power and more than a quarter feeling too cold at home most or all of the time. And around 800,000 people surveyed, older people, had actually left their home to seek warmth in a public space such as a shopping centre or a library. I heard from older constituents who were using their free bus passes to ride around in buses during the day mm. just to keep warm. Shame. And that is a scandal. Yeah. And it's also not an option for some mm. people because when we're talking about people with disabilities and their carers, they would not be hopping on and off different buses mm. just to try and keep warm. So I do want to turn to eligibility for the warm home discount and I think it's mm. important that we got to this um, in mm. the debate. The We Care campaign recommends that the government extends eligibility for the warm home discount to include people with disabilities and unpaid carers. The warm home discount was changed by the government this winter, but not to extend it to include people with disabilities mm. and unpaid carers. In fact, quite the opposite. Money saving expert Martin Lewis estimated that 290,000 existing claimants who have disabilities and who only claim personal independence payment, attendance allowance or disability living allowance, which are not means tested, will no longer get the warm home discount. My experience um, as a constituency MP uh, of the changes made by governments is of being contacted by constituents who formally received the warm home discount, finding mm. they were no longer eligible. Mm. The reason given back to us by the government in most cases was that the discount was now targeted on properties which have a high energy cost score based on their characteristics. But I have to say, uh, in my experience, some newer properties can be cold and difficult to mm. heat. So just basing it on age mm. of property, I understand the procedure was uh, using the valuation agency mm. uh, to set characteristics and then pushing that through an algorithm. And um, Martin Lewis has actually sh shown, I think, that, that, that that's mistaken. And I do say to the minister that I know from my own experience, some people on very low incomes have been denied the warm home discount mm. this winter. I feel these changes are wrong and I urge the government to look at this again. Mm. It's time that there was extra support for people with a disability mm. and their unpaid carers to help them cope with these unprecedented financial pressures due to the energy bill crisis mm. and the cost of living crisis. And I hope the government will think again after this debate today. Here, here. Mm. Twist. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Robert, and it's a pleasure to serve with you as chair for this debate. And thank you to the Petitions Committee uh, for arranging this important debate today. Now, we know that many people are struggling at the moment as a result of the cost of living crisis, generally. But disabled people, as we've heard, are struggling more than most. And households which include someone with a disability uh, spend more on food, face higher energy costs, and they're also more likely to have a lower household income. And actually, it was really interesting to hear uh, my honourable friend, the member for for Battersea talking about the survey which um, showed some very tragic results from those experiencing these conditions and I thank her for referring uh, to that. Um, but in total, analysis by the disability charity Scope, as we've heard, suggests that on average disabled households need that additional £975 a month that we've heard about to have the same standard of living as non-disabled households. 
and that rises to over £1,100 if we account for this year's inflation. These figures account for disability benefits payments like PIP, which are designed to help address these costs. Now, for some families, these costs have a shocking impact. Disabled people are almost three times as likely to live in material deprivation than the rest of the population. An 80% of households with a disabled person say that government cost of living payments were just not enough to meet the increased costs that we've heard that, that they face and that we've heard about today. They might come as uh, families accrue costs due to cost of expensive dietary requirements, for example, running medical equipment, as we've heard, or even just being unable to cut back on their heating because of needing that higher temperature and the adverse impact which lower temperatures would uh, have on the vulnerable ones. Now, I'm just thinking back to this time last year when uh, many of us will have attended a Marie Curie drop-in when they published their report, Dying in Poverty. Um, as I say, I was just checking, it's just a year ago now, uh, and presented their research on the impact of um, poverty and, and um, having, in this case, terminal illness. At that drop-in, I met, and others will have met, uh, a lady with a terminal cancer diagnosis and her husband. They were on a water meter, and they said to me, without me asking, it wasn't kind of featured, that they were running up hugely significant costs because of the need to do constant washing um, in order to limit the risk of infection. And actually what struck me from that meeting is that too little is known about the help that is available already through uh, water companies and others to support people, but it's not enough to meet the general needs. That's just one tiny proportion, in this case more significant um, than, than others. And uh, uh, that reminds me uh, of the comments made by the Honourable Member for Blackpool and Cleveleys uh, about social tariffs. And I just want to talk about that a little while. Uh, as co-chair of the all-party group on water, we have been looking at, uh, at the proposals for a social tariff for water uh, and looking at, at the impact and, and working with the Consumer Council on Water on that. And I'm very disappointed to hear that the government has dropped the idea uh, of pursuing that social tariff, something that was revealed when I asked them written parliamentary questions quite recently. But I, I acknowledge some of the difficulties that he mentions but I do think we need to look at something which does support people much more generally. And, of course, uh, we talked as well, or he talked as well, about the energy propo you know, proposal for, say, energy social tariffs and whether that's the best way. And I don't argue, I genuinely think he was a thoughtful argument about that, but I think we need to look very closely at how people can be supported. And today, clearly, we are focusing on people with disabilities. So... It's the rising cost of energy, as we've heard, that's affecting disabled families the most severely. One respondent to a Guardian survey said that he'd stopped using a CPAP machine during the day, even when he was short of breath, in order to limit his bills. Ventilators, suction pumps, feed pumps, power chairs, electric beds, these are all pieces of equipment that cost money to run, and families are going for days without heating or showering just so that they can keep this equipment turned on. And again, it seems to me that there is very little understanding of what may be covered. So assurances can be given that these costs can be met and covered, but actually, in many cases, they're not. So we need to make sure that that support is there. Now, for some families, these extra costs are coming at a time when they're desperately trying to make memories with their loved ones with terminal illnesses. Marie Curie have reported that the costs of energy bills can rise by as much as 75% in the aftermath of their diagnoses. And they've also found that 90,000 people die in poverty every year. Now, during DWP questions in December, I raised the issue of changes to the Warm Homes Discount Scheme which, with the Minister, which removed eligibility from 300,000 disabled people, leaving many families 
afraid of being unable to meet their heightened energy costs. And for, good, and for goodness sake, £150 isn't going to address the problem anyway. But it is better to have that money than to lose it as part of the uh, uh, system. And that was something which happened, in my view, quite, quite quietly and was little known about at the time. And it's important that we address it. And these changes suggest to me that the government weren't willing to address the disability price tag. Excluding disabled households from the bulk of cost of living support, unless they are on means-tested benefits, um, forces them to absorb the additional costs themselves by emptying their own pockets. The £150 payment is equivalent to just £2.88 per week across the year and just does not do enough to reduce the costs down to the already staggering costs faced by households who don't have uh, a member with disability. Why should these families be worse off just because one of them has a disability and lives with that? This is a disparity that government policy is, in my view, failing to address. Now, speaking in these general terms is great for drawing attention to the broader problems and the broader issues. But the reality is that each of us as MPs will meet and support in our constituencies people with disabilities facing exactly these problems. And that's before we start talking about PIP assessments and, and eligibility uh, and the support they need there. These are real people. They're individuals and families uh, living in our area, in our constituency, like those that I and other members will meet um, and people that we met at the Marie Curie drop-in. And they deserve not to have the additional worry of struggling to meet their energy bills or being cold and damaging their their health further potentially. Now I hope that having this debate today will cause the government to have another look at this issue and reconsider the support that they're providing. I hope they will ask themselves how much less money and resources are we comfortable with these households, um, with people with disabilities having compared to other families. Unless the answer is tens of thousands of pounds a year there is still a huge amount of work for the government to do. And I know, I believe, that people do need much more support and there is much work to do. Amy Callaghan, you can speak seated if you're more comfortable doing that. Do not make do so, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Robert. Um, it's a pleasure to see you in the chair and for your welcome, welcome help with that there as well. I thank the Petitions Committee and the petitioners here today for shining a light on this important issue. I would consider the word for this debate isn't confidence, as the Honourable Member suggested, but abandoned. People right across these aisles feel abandoned by this Tory government, and this applies even more so to disabled people. Abandoned by an unkind, uncaring government who fa fail to recognise their individual needs and tailor financial support accordingly. I think we need to remember and reflect on what we're actually debating today. The cost of living isn't a neat wee slogan to describe the really tough times we're living through. We're debating how much it costs to live. Now, we've all lived through the 2008 financial crash, and things are considerably bleaker now than they were back then. Currently, 46% of people right across these aisles think their kids will be worse off than them, which, while shocking, is hardly a surprise, given interest rates, the soaring cost of goods, and 13 years of Tory austerity. Food prices are up more than 19%, electricity up 16% and gas up 129%. Chain and energy rich Scotland, these price increases are harder to take. I have constituents desperately clutching to energy bills at every surgery. And the cost of living is proving increasingly challenging for our constituents living with a disability. The government's £150 disability cost of living payment is welcome, of course but a drop in the ocean compared to the astronomical bills people are facing. So I asked the Minister, what does he expect disabled people to spend a £150 payment on? A weekly shop, half or less of some assisted, assistive technology, or mitigating for sanctions from his department? And does he really think that £150 is enough to make a tangible difference in the lives of disabled people? Chair, disabled people are disproportionately affected by the cost of living crisis. The disability pay gap means that disabled people earn on average almost £2 less an hour than those without a disability, even more pertinent with, rising, with a rising disabled population 
and a damning indictment of this unkind Tory government. In work poverty is real, and because of the policies of austerity, folk are living in at the length and breadth of these aisles. Chairing a recent visit to Deafblind Scotland, based in my constituency in Lenzie, me and my honourable friend from Mother and Wishaw had a roundtable discussion with service users. We heard how challenging life can be for deafblind people, particularly with the increased cost of living and the cost of assistive technology. Now, in Scotland, we have, well, across the UK, we have a public health service free at the point of need, but access to healthcare is still a class issue, with 70% of people having to limit access to medical appointments due to the lack of financial support with the increased cost of living. And we know that disabled people are less likely to be able to afford these increased costs. Now, Chair, I despise the word mitigate. The Scottish Government isn't there and shouldn't be there to mitigate for bad decisions made in this place. What the Scottish Government is there for is to stand up and to provide for our people. It should be there to lead, not to mop up, and to not to mop up the mess of bad policy decisions and bad governance from governments of Westminster. And unfortunately, that now means to shield folk from the policies of austerity. But we forget that it's not just the new policies and the social security system that the Scottish Government are providing. They spend £594 million each year mitigating for bad policies from this place. Mitigating for the bedroom tax, for the benefit cap. If these Tory welfare reforms hadn't been imposed, it's estimated that each family in Scotland would be £2,500 better off each year. People in Scotland would be facing the cost of living crisis so much more harshly if it weren't for these mitigations. Now for the clear blue water between the Tory government down here and the Scottish government up the road. A tale of two governments. The Tory government who have removed the very welcome £20 a week increase to universal credit. And the Scottish government who have not just uprated social security but introduced brand new payments including the Scottish child payment lifting children out of poverty. We don't pay for prescriptions in Scotland, meaning everyone can access the medication they need to manage health conditions, whilst the government down here have failed to do likewise, meaning 51% of people have had to limit access to medication. This Tory government are failing our constituents and Labour have no policies to turn this around. Fortunately, whilst Westminster continues to fail, the people of, Sc the people of Scotland can rely on the Scottish Government to deliver on fairness and equality. And of course, Chair, we look forward um, to our future as an independent nation within the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. It's a pleasure to speak at this debate and to serve under your chairship. And I'd like to thank my honourable friend and neighbouring MP, the MP for Battersea, for a very powerful uh, uh, opening speech, setting out so many issues that are faced by thousands of people across this country, including in my constituency of Putney. And I'd like to thank Rachel, Abigail and Katie for bringing this petition, for enabling thousands of people to say not enough government time is spent in this place debating these issues on behalf of all of those people who are so affected by them. And I'd like to use this time to highlight three particular groups of people who've come to me in my constituency um, and about the difficulties that they face. One is young people with cancer. The second is people who have ME or CFS. And the third is people who've had stem cell or bone marrow transplants. All of them face unique uh, situations, which mean that the cost of living crisis is driving so many people into both f worsening physical condition, worsening mental health conditioning, and into poverty. But they are also examples of those situations faced by so many other people with long-term illnesses and disabilities across the country. For research suggests that tens of thousands of 18 to 39-year-olds with cancer are struggling to pay basic living costs. More than half of the 18 to 39-year-olds with cancer surveyed by Macmillan and Virgin Money said that they needed more financial support to manage the rising cost of living. One in four young people are getting further into debt or have fallen behind paying rent or energy bills because of increased living costs, according to a survey of 2,000 people. And the research found that almost three-quarters of younger people with cancer were worried about the cost of food over the next 12 months. This hits them particularly hard at a time of life when they haven't been able to save up, they haven't got that, any, any kind of um, safety net for, of their own to fall back on, and they were looking forward to a different kind of life than they are suddenly facing. 
more than a tenth of those surveyed said that they have to delay or cancel medical appointments due to the rising cost of petrol of getting to those appointments. So this is actually a false economy, meaning that people will be iller for longer because of the um, payments that they're not getting. People with cancer already face significant extra costs of nearly £900 when they get diagnosed, such as buying extra clothes, food or their increased heating costs. But now inflation has driven those costs up and, they've seen, and Macmillan have seen a surge in demand for means-tested financial grants themselves to help cancer patients with costs. So Macmillan and Young Lives Versus Cancer are calling on the government to give more financial help to cancer patients. But it's not just about money. They have found that it's actually delays in the payments that are also causing financial crisis, and surely this can be rectified. There's an average 18-week wait to claim a disability allowance that could help young people with travel and heating costs. The money is there. They're just not being able to get it because of that 18-week delay. So they're asking the government to take urgent steps to reduce those delays. The second group of people I'd like to highlight are those people who have ME or CFS. And I'm a member of the all-party parliamentary group on ME who have produced a report on this, which I would recommend to all members and, and all those reading this speech. It's clear from the evidence presented to the all-party parliamentary group that too many people with ME are being refused even the payments that are being allocated to others. So they're being refused the PIP by the DWP. They, are, they can take the decision to appeal, but too many people with ME who've taken this action have gone on to win their case, which indicates there are flaws in the system. But many are not able to go through the complex appeals process, which ex requires a considerable amount of preparation from the claimant, which would exa exacerbate their symptoms. As a result, many people with ME are existing without the financial support that they need. And there are some issues about the welfare assessments, which are particular to the condition of ME. Um, as, there can, as the condition is variable throughout the day, having a snapshot can, also, can sometimes not be um, applicable to their general circumstances. The second is that the length of time an activity can be maintained can often be, not be used by people with ME, so that they're being underscored by assessors as being able to carry out a task, as if they could carry that, that out for a long time, which they can't because of their fluctuating symptoms. Uh, and also, there are after effects of carrying out tasks. So people with ME may be able to carry out a task for an assessment, but then have extreme post-exertional malaise, which follows the completion of that task, but then doesn't get assessed as part of it. And also, people with ME are being pressurised by their private health insurers to undertake a course of grade exercise therapy, or GET, in many circumstances, despite detrimental effects to many, in order to keep their insurance-based health and disability payments. So there are many recommendations from the all-party parliamentary group, which I would urge the Minister to look at in terms of the ways in which people with ME are assessed and whether they're getting the payments that they need to meet um, their needs for, with the cost of living crisis. And Sir Robert, the third group I'd like to highlight today are those who have stem cell therapy or bone marrow transplants. A recent survey by the Anthony Nolan Tr Trust found that two-thirds of people who've had stem cell therapy struggle to heat their home. Over a half struggled to afford food and a half struggled to afford travel to hospital. This means that a half have taken on debts or have had to move home because of this and a third, three quarters have had to give up work or cut their hours because of their stem cell therapy, but then are not able to get back into work. 90% say that their physical health has worsened as a result of the financial problems that they're facing. Often people who've had stem cell therapy have to have very regular checkups once a week after the, the operation originally, and they may have to go further away to the specialist hospitals as well, so they incur greater costs. One parent of a stem cell transplant patient said, the rising cost of living has crucified me. I've had to walk 12 miles a day to take my children to school because she wasn't able to afford the transport. So there is a healthcare travel cost scheme for certain patients, but it has a very high threshold for eligibility. So as well as looking at the rising cost, the increased costs for heating, also, the increased cost for travel is that highlighted by this group of people. So establishing a patient travel fund 
for stem cell patients, who are about 4,000 a year in the UK. Um, so Robert has been uh, recommended, but also extending the Warms Home discount. And they have also highlighted the timely access to benefits as being one of their th top three biggest problems financially with their cost of living crisis. So these present costs to our economy, people who are on long-term sick leave, personal costs to people with disabilities and their family. The government needs to understand needs and extra costs incurred by, dis by people with disabilities and the physical and mental health results of this that drives more people into poverty. So to conclude, will the minister meet with me and these affected groups of particular groups um, that, have, that are facing cost of living crisis additional needs? Will the government review the impact of the cost of living crisis on people with disabilities highlighted by these petitions and so many others? Will the government increase travel and heating payments in the short term to alleviate this current crisis? But in the long term, will the government overhaul the social security payment system, putting the needs of people with disabilities at their centre? Thank you. Emma Shannon. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak today in this debate. And I wish to thank and put on record all my thanks to all of those who signed the petition to enable us uh, uh, to discuss these issues today. And in particular, I'd like to, uh, as I always do and do sincerely and honestly, the Honourable Lady for Battersea for setting the scene so well. Uh, a lady with compassion, understanding, delivers a message, uh, a message that we can all concur and support and, and be here for. And to all the uh, right honourable and honourable members who have made contributions and those who will follow. I, I very much look forward to, to their contributions. I very much look forward to the Minister as well. Uh, I think the Minister understands the issues that we're looking for and, and I have a number of questions I wish to ask him, uh, along with others, and I hope that uh, we, we can achieve the goals we wish to achieve and, and also ultimately uh, the answers as well. I, I've stated many times, uh, as so many others, that the cost of living has impacted on so many people. These issues haven't subsided yet. <clears throat> we are still seeing incredibly high costs for the most basic of needs, and there are many that are struggling to afford. I, I always wish uh, Sir Robert to give an ordinary perspective to these debates. Members expect it, and they'll get it today as well. Uh, I, my my uh, observations and, and contributions will, will reflect uh, what others have said in, 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 in relation to the needs that we have. Uh, this debate is uh, specifically about the cost of living and support for disabled people, and I wish to focus upon that. Um, I see every day in my <coughs> office, and, and more so over the last period of time, I'm not blaming government for it, by the way. I, that's not what it's about, Sir Robert. It's about the solutions. I'm always about solutions, uh, solution led, solution driven, uh, and, and that's what I wish to see. So I'm going to ask, I'll, I'll make a contribution and ask for some questions to be answered in relation to that. Um, especially those who are uh, the money who are struggling to afford, uh, especially those who are, who are disabled and are financially challenged in this uh, current climate. It's important that, that um, exceptions are made for them and that their specific needs are taken into consideration. I see the poverty every day in, in my constituency, Sir Robert. I see uh, families struggling to, to, to deal. I see mums who uh, uh, probably starve themselves so that their children can get food. Those are the realities of, of, of where we are, uh, and that's why I think uh, I look to the minister and to government to, to uh, uh, achieve and, and make the changes that are so important, so that we can we can address the issues that we see every day. Every one of us here, as a, as a active uh, um, MPs, see those issues as well. Um, the, the DWP needs to expedite, as the honourable lady for Pudsey referred to, uh, the, the uh, DWP system. And the fact that it takes so long for it to, to progress for those who are in disabilities, uh, I think, and I'll, we've asked this before in the chamber, so today we ask the same question again. Can that be uh, expedited? Food bank referrals in my constituency, we had the front page of my local paper there a week before last, uh, where the leader of, or the person who looks at manager of the food bank, and it's the first Trussell food bank in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's a very active one. Um, and their their um, referrals were, were up as much as 50%. Uh, that's in one year. Wow. You need to, I, I need to take a deep breath when I say that and understand that. Uh, Christians Against Poverty, the, the organisation started just over a year and a half ago. Um, I, again, their referrals are, are quite significant as well. All these people come together to help. And I'm very much encouraged by the number of churches, by the number of individuals who help these organisations. 
number lady for Putney always referred, also referred to, to benefit issues and referred to ME uh, uh, as one example of, of how they're unable to cope with their systems and, uh, and the system of DWP for the appeals process uh, for how long that takes. I, I would also add to that, that those with anxiety, those with depression, those with uh, emotional issues, because I see those as well. Um, you see the anxiety, you see the... I, 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 I wouldn't have said anything different than anybody who doesn't have an experience, but when they come to the office, um, um, they, they, they're, they're quite anxious. They're, 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 uh, they're extremely confused about uh, the system that's before them. So I, again, Minister, I, I would ask uh, what's been done to help those people who have anxiety, anxiety with depression, uh, with emotional um, overtures, which are, affect their everyday life. Um, we, I, I know the Minister wants to help. Uh, I certainly want to help, and I wish, and, and on behalf of others, I would like to see that happening as well. And, and not only do you have uh, those issues, you also have complex physical needs, uh, which compound the issues uh, and, and uh, uh, confuse sometimes the, the DWP's uh, interpretation of what we have as a person sits in front of you, which I see it uh, very clearly. I have a, one lady in my office, one of my staff members, she does nothing else with benefits. Um, uh, not everybody understands their benefit system. Uh, they need coaxing, they need help, they need uh, uh, s support, and we try to do that. One of the petitions that has been discussed today is that surrounding the £650 payment uh, and that people with disabilities should be eligible for this too. What is particularly important for me, uh, Sir Robert, um, uh, in relation to this, is that some people who suffer with disabilities have very specific needs, some too in relation to the foods, the very foods they eat, the diet they have. Um, and, and, and by having a specialised diet, there's a cost factor in that. Um, the inflation, absolutely. Yes. Uh, just reminded me that of the work that we have done together on rare diseases, and of course, so many people. I'm thinking, for example, of Muscular Dystrophy UK mm -hmm. produced their own reports on the impact mm -hmm. uh, and and the impact of um, cost of living rises and how that affects their well-being. Again, the Honourable Lady for Bladen uh, sets the scene very well, and thank you for that intervention, because it, it reminds us all, Sir Robert, uh, of, of the impacts that are, are upon a, a section of the community across this, this great United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but we see it every day, and we're trying to convey that in a, in a way that maybe the Minister can, can grasp that uh, uh, focus that we're trying to put on this issue and give us the answers uh, that we seek. Inflation rates for food uh, have gone up in the last year by 13.1% Northern and expanding this payment to people who suffer with disabilities would help them to stick to the routine and rely on what they need to stay alive. I don't, make any, I don't exaggerate the matter, Sir Robert. This, they need it to stay alive, and, and that's what, I, what I, I, I see in my constituency on a regular basis. In addition to this, Sir Robert, I've had numerous constituents raised concerns with me regarding the amount it costs to run certain types of medical equipment. I know the Honourable Gentleman for Blackpool North and uh, um, Cleveland uh, set, that, set that scene, but the fact is I, I, I deal with this every week. Uh, people with stair lifts, pumps for feeding uh, tubes, <coughs> electric wheelchairs, um, uh, the, the, and more of them than ever with mobility scooters as well, bath seats. These are these are things that we do ourselves because we're able-bodied, but our constituents cannot, uh, without help, deal with the extra charges that come their way. So I would urge, can, compassionately, uh, respectfully, to the Minister and to Government to provide some form of grant that would help ease costs for people if they must, and there are many who do, run medical equipment. These issues aren't just monetary. They are there for a lifetime, and unfortunately, it's a sad reality that some people require these pieces of piece equipment to survive, to continue to live. It's often life and death if they don't have these. That's the cold reality, Sir Robert, of where we are today with some of my constituents and, and with others who have spoken. They are no stranger to the increases of electricity and gas heating, and it's unfortunate that so many of my constituents have to deal with the impacts of this. We must, I believe, do more to speak on behalf of those who are disabled and struggling to pay the increased cost of electricity and heating payments. This is certainly a conversation to be had surrounding disabled people and employment, and I, and I need to air this today as well. And This is the chance perhaps to do this, but uh, ho hopefully um, uh, Sir Robert in a constructive way. For some of those who are on non-means tested benefits, there is an option for getting into some employment, uh, and, and, uh, which must firstly be made accessible to them. Many employers, and I welcome the employers who have made a constructive and positive um, 
um, decision uh, to, to uh, make their work more disabled friendly. And it's also wonderful to see an encouragement into work by so many, uh, and there is still some more to be done in terms of this matter. Well, I'm absolutely, yes, absolutely, yeah. On this point of accessible workspaces, um, mm. this place which legislates for equality is very hard to, to get to adapt for people with disabilities. Mm. So how can we expect other, other workplaces to take the onus themselves to make, to make workspaces more accessible for people? I thank the Honourable Lady who uh, speaks with knowledge, uh, understanding and with a real deep uh, uh, request to see change. I, I, again, Minister, the, the, the Honourable Lady has very, very clearly, very capably put forward that request and maybe when you're responding, Minister, you can respond how this place can improve its, uh, uh, its uh, disability access. Um, I, I know there's much been done in here, but we live in an old building. Uh, where there probably needs to be a lot more done than what would normally be the case. So, uh, again, I thank the Honourable Lady for that as well. Uh, it, for those who, um, I, I believe, uh, for those who have the, who, uh, the, the course of the re reliability of employment for some extra money, is always going to be of help to people. So, as I understand government policy, I welcome it. I think it's positive. But could I ask the Minister, could he outline the government strategy for those with disability and returning to part-time work if possible. And I speak for those, I, 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 again, I, I speak with, with, with the knowledge and the experience, and much smarter than anybody else, Sir Robert, I'm definitely not. But I just, I just uh, reflect, or I try to reflect what, what people tell me in, in, in a debate such as this. And that's those who have a fear about returning to work because they're not quite sure if they can do it. Now, they want to go back to work, but the reality is that some of them can't do that. And, and, and whether they may have three days a week or maybe have two weeks together where they cannot cope, for some people to return to work is not an option. So, so I, I think that when it comes to dealing and trying to give people the option, those with dis disabilities the option, a, a real compassionate and understanding has to be uh, paramount in how that is done. So I, I seek, Minister, if I can, um, um, a, a clear understanding from government policy in relation to how this will be done in a way that reflects what people are. I mean, the fact is, they want to work, uh, but those days and those weeks that they're on and able to means that they can't, uh, and, and we need to make sure that that's right. The disability resolution found that in January 2023, um, the gap in household income between adults with and without a disability was around 30%, including disability benefits. That's quite a significant figure. And 44% and, and for those who are excluding disability benefits in the financial year 2021. And furthermore, Sir Robert, a third of adults in the lowest income group are disabled. Those figures, it's not the government's fault, by the way, Sir Robert. Uh, we understand. Those are facts. Those are, that's where we are. It's a data. Uh, but it's how, how uh, we, we, we respond in a positive fashion. One-off payment is all very well and good. And, and the Honourable Gentleman for Blackpool North and Cleveland referred to that. And, and it was good, and it is good that government has reached out and given that extra money. But, but can I say that perhaps maybe what we really need is, is an ongoing vision for the next year or maybe the next uh, period of time where, where those uh, benefits uh, and, and the help for the, the energy payments, etc., are done in a constructive and, and, and um, um, statistical way to ensure that, we, that there's a vision for the future for those people who are disabled. Um, while the, the assessment is good, uh, made whether there's a positive impact on the efficiency of paying bills, the one-off payment uh, does take pressure, but it does, I believe, need to be negotiated in a different way. Of course, Sir Robert, the fact is any help from government has reached deep into their pockets uh, to ensure uh, that, that, that there is uh, uh, help for the people. Benefits must be felt over a longer space of time to truly help. I conclude with this comment, uh, 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 Sir Robert. There is no doubt that the cost of living crisis has had uh, an impact on everyone, but we do and we must look to government uh, at how the specifics are impacted right now. And, and, and I again request the Minister and Government to support them, whilst times are increasingly difficult. And really, Sir Robert, not only difficult, they're also very uncertain. Thank you. We now move on to the front bench wind-ups. Mariam Fellows. Thank you, Sir Robert, and it's indeed a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. 
And I want to thank the Petitions Committee um, uh, for bringing forward this really important debate. But more importantly, I want to thank the petitioners and those who signed their petition. And I also want to pay tribute to the We Care campaign, who provided me with an excellent briefing for today. Uh, the Honourable Member for North Blackpool and Cleveland has mentioned that I had a debate in this place last week, last Tuesday it was, and I immediately re uh, reprised <laughs> that debate in the, our opposition day on Tuesday afternoon. So some of this I could probably do without notes, and I'm not going to <laughs> reprise every single statistic that was brought in force. But nothing has changed since last week. I wouldn't, even I wouldn't expect that to have happened so quickly. But the cost of living and how it affects those disabled people and their carers is something that this government really has to take very, very seriously and do something about it. Um, everyone has said most of what I was going to say already today. But I'm going to repeat some of it because it is way, way far too important not for it to be repeated. So I think there's real um, agreement across the chamber today that this government must do more to support disabled people who are far more likely to live in poverty than those who are not disabled. And they are particularly vulnerable to the rising cost of living Households across the UK and Scotland continue to face extremely challenging economic conditions. Um, we know that um, inflation, uh, food inflation is still at 19.1% a year. And for many disabled people on special diets, that's even, an even higher cost. We know that uh, inflation disproportionately impacts lower income groups. And that is certainly <laughs> true of disabled people who who all spend a relatively higher proportion of their income on eating and keeping warm. And according to Scope, um, disabled people are almost three times as likely to live in poverty than the rest of the population. Three times more likely. And that includes any disability benefits they get. Uh, disabled uh, households have to use a lot of their money uh, to run uh, powerful machines to help them live a, nor a more normal life. They have to pay for uh, more to get to hospital because they can't generally use public transport. I mean, it, the list of things that cost more for disabled people in their households is just incredible. And it's something that this government really, really has to take on board. On that point, yeah. Yeah. the other one is actually right, and, and it's just come to mind as, as Ellen Murray was speaking, and that's on the issue of, of unable to travel. And the reason why some of my constituents can't travel in buses is because of the anxiety issues, the panic attacks uh, they, that happen to them whenever they're out somewhere. Whenever they see a crowd of people, they automatically become uh, very centrally uh, focused upon where they are. They panic, and, and, and because of that, they can't do that. What they need is taxis. Can they afford them? No, they can't. I thank the Honourable Member uh, from Strangford for his intervention. And as usual, he's absolutely right. And oh, how we missed him last week. Um, so, Robert, it's Scope last week issued um, their latest report on the disability price tag. I was um, privileged to go to their reception last Thursday, along with the, the Honourable Member on um, the front bench opposite. And it has always been the case that it costs more if you're disabled just to live. Mm -hmm. But in these times of the rising cost of living and huge inflation, it's even worse. So the scope came, said that for a disabled household, it can cost an additional £975, £975 per month to have the same standard of living as non-disabled households. And if you can count for inflation, that cost would rise to £1,122 per month. And not one single person in this room believes that disabled households, disabled people are actually getting that kind of money. And against this um, worrying backdrop, the SNP really remain deeply concerned about the UK government's welfare policies. The cost of living payments in 22 
2022 and 2023 were designed to help families meet rising prices. However, according to Scope again, 80% of disabled people, 80% said these payments were not enough to meet the increased costs they face, such as the... Um, so, you know, this support is welcome. I mean, no one's going to say no thank you. But uh, one-off payments, are like the £650 petition for you today, are only a temporary fix mm -hmm. when permanent solutions are needed. Rather than offering one-off payments to shore up the incomes of struggling families, this government should reverse the damaging policies that are impacting on our most vulnerable. Here, so here. I go back to legacy benefit mm -hmm. claimants during the pandemic didn't even get the £20 a week increase. Yep. Uh, uh, it, it should be, it should, they should have had it. They should have had it restored, and they should have, it should have actually been increased in. Uh, the meantime. In, in his uh, recent submission to the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, Human Rights Watch not only gives a damning review of the UK government's restrictive social security policies, such as the two-child limit or the failure to reverse the cut to universal credit, but also highlights it's worth noting that the £20 weekly increase was never applied worth repeating to an estimated 2 million people on legacy benefits who were still waiting, still waiting uh, uh, on transition to the universal credit system. And this government has to really take on board the lives of disabled people. Mr. S, I beg your pardon, Sir Robert, the continual refusal of the UK government to fix the extensive known problems with the social security system is unacceptable. Now, I know the Health and Disability White Paper has looked at promising to do things later on, but that's not good enough. We need changes now. We need changes that actually help vulnerable people. So, Robert, I always get a bit emotional when I do these debates, and, and I, I, I think that's a fault of mine, so please forgive me. But I really think that... I really think that this government should look at examples from other places. Now, in Scotland, we try really hard with a fixed budget to make life better for, for our here, citizens. Here. So, Scottish government run their social security system on the idea of dignity, fairness, and they also look at trying to deal more on a daily basis with people who have lived experience. And I know that's something the government is now doing, and I commend the minister for that. But I think it really needs to do something along the lines of what the Go Scottish Government has done, is they're having a new disability equality strategy. They're in pre that's in preparation. And they, keep, um, they will keep working with disabled groups to actually make this worthwhile and to do stuff that really impacts on the lives of disabled people. Some of the other things the Scottish Government has done recently has doubled, they've doubled their fuel insecurity fund to 20 million and confirmed another 20 million for 2023-24. They've uh, introduced a new winter heating payment which replaces the cold weather payment and provides a stable amount every year to help around 400,000 low income individuals with heating expenses. And even though there was no statutory requirement to do so, they upgraded the winter heating payment by 10.1%. They, they look at the Scottish Government has um, a scheme whereby it looks at energy official and fuel poverty. And it's really important that this government actually does that as well, because we leak energy in this country across the UK, and especially in uh, the parts that don't have um, the schemes that the Scottish Government has put in place. Sir so Robert, it's, Scottish Government's done everything, everything in its limited powers. But every time they mitigate against some of the policies that the UK Government 
imposes on us, they have to take the money from somewhere else. And actually, the only answer to that, as far as I am concerned, as far as the SNP is concerned, and as far as almost 50% of the Scottish population are concerned, independence is the answer to that. Sir Robert, social, a social tariff for um, energy is something that we would support. I think it's something that is necessary. And as I see the, the Honourable Member for uh, North Blackpool and Cleves is, is a nice place. And it was something he tried to say might not work. But we have to grasp every opportunity possible to help dis, uh, disabled households, carers and families who are struggling on a daily basis with the cost of living. Politics, Sir Robert, is about choice and political will. Can we please see better choices and greater political will from this government and listen to disabled people and their carers and do better? PIP payments, for example, are meant to enhance living for disabled people. As has been said already, it doesn't even touch the sides. So please um, ask the minister to really talk about this and to actually comment himself on social tariffs for energy. Can we please also consider, Minister, that the best solution to meet um, disabled people is to spend money less on things like replacing Chuck Trident and using the money saved to pour into social benefits so that people with disabilities, their carers and their families, have a better cost of living in, uh, have a better uh, and cheaper cost of living. Sir Robert, I don't think there's anyone in this room today doesn't agree that things have to be better mm -hmm. for the disabled communities. And it's up to this current government to try their very best and to take on board what other countries are doing and to improve lives and actually grant the petitioners. I think they were very modest in what they asked for a 650 one-off payment. That is not going to be the answer going forward and that's what we need, solutions going forward. Here, here. Shadow Minister Vicky Foxcroft. I thank you and it's a pleasure to serve on you your chairship, Sir Robert. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to respond on behalf of the Shadow Work and Pensions team. And I, like the member for Motherwell and Wilshaw, may repeat some of the stuff from last week, but it is important to do so because we need those changes so we don't have to keep coming back round and debating this. And there is no doubt that disabled people are being disproportionately impacted by the cost of living crisis. And it's right, sadly, that we are once again debating it in this place. I want to thank my honourable friend, the member for Battersea, for her passionate opening contributions, sharing the experiences of so many people and explaining why it's unacceptable that people live in those situations in 2023. And as her and others have, I also want to thank Abigail and Katie for organising this petition. And I'd also like to take a moment to pay tribute to the countless disabled people, friends, families, advocates, advocates, disabled people's organisations and charities who signed the petition which triggered this debate and campaigned tirelessly to promote disabled people's rights. Now, the Honourable Member for Blackpool North and Cleveland eloquently put forward the extra costs for having a disability and as he said, these costs will vary depending on the specific disability an individual has, but they may include assistive equipment, care and therapies. And as he noted in one of the petitions that triggered this debate, some may need to run ventilators, pumps for feeding tubes, CPAP machines, and so the list goes on. Disabled households tend to spend more on essential goods and services such as heating, food and travel. Some disabled people find it difficult to keep warm if their movement is restricted. And as an honourable member for Worsley and Eccles South said, 
these costs are also borne by unpaid carers and how we must look at the We Care campaign. We also know that some disabled people might need to purchase more expensive foods if they have specific dietary requirements or have difficulty preparing raw ingredients. And we know very well high inflation in 2022 and 2023 has been driven by high food and energy costs. So it stands to reason that disabled people are among those most affected by the cost of living crisis. And as a, as a member for Battersea and the member for Worsley and Eccles and the member for Bladen said, last month, Disability Equality Charity Scope released updated <coughs> research on the extra costs associated with having a disability, the so-called disability price tag. <coughs> and when Scope last calculated the price tag in 2019, it stood at £583 per month. And over the last four years, it has risen to a shocking £975 per month, equivalent to 63% of household income. And this means that disabled households need to find almost £12,000 extra per year to achieve the same standard of living as non-disabled households. And as the Honourable Member for Putney articulated, the challenges for young people with cancer, having not built up a safety net, and the extra costs they face, and particularly with many missing hospital appointments due to not being able to afford their travel costs. This obviously wasting money in the system, as well as delaying their essential treatment. It's heartbreaking. And the impact of these rising costs is further exasperated by the fact that disabled people also tend to have lower than average earnings. In its January 2023 report, the resolution found that the gap in household income between adults with and with a, without a disability was around 30%, including disability benefits, and 44% excluded in them. And as we know, disabled people who are not able to work are entitled to claim income replacement benefits. And in addition, all disabled people can claim extra co cost benefits to help cover the extra costs with having a disability. And I'm sure the minister will respond when he comes back to us that in the autumn statement, the chancellor committed to uprating benefits in line with inflation. However, this only took effect from the start of 2023-24 financial year. And no doubt he will also tell us that the government has taken steps to support disabled people through the crisis by delivering the disability cost of living payments. But as the Honourable Member for Bladen said, 80% of disabled people said this wasn't enough to live on. Now, at a similar debate last week, I reminded the Minister that hundreds of thousands of people are no longer entitled to the Warm Homes discount, and many members have mentioned this today. So, since the Government excluded those who claim disability living allowance, personal independent payments and attendance allowance. So, I do hope that he responds to the many questions that have been asked on this. And in addition... Disability Rights UK, among many others, have said that the lack of meaningful increase in disability benefits over recent years means that the extra support given to disabled people has barely touched the sides. Trussell Trust figures show that even in early 2020, 62% of working age people referred to food banks were disabled. Mm. And a MENCAP survey has revealed that 35% of people with a learning disability have skipped meals to cut back on costs, and 38% had not turned their heating on despite being cold. And the Honourable Member for Oldham East and Saddleworth and Battersea talked of the importance of incorporating the URS 
and the UNCRPD into law. So I'll finish with what I said last week, but this really does relate to that, by asking the Minister to commit to working closely with disabled people and disabled people's organisations to actually try and find a solution to this crisis. Thank you. I call the Minister... Um, Tom Persclough, can I just remind members that there may be a division shortly and I will suspend the meeting for 15 minutes if that's the case. Minister. Well, thank you um, very much, Sir Mark, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I just begin um, by thanking um, the Honourable Lady um, for Battersea for introducing this debate. We don't always agree on everything, but she undoubtedly speaks with great passion about these issues. And may I also thank... Um, Abigail and Katie for the work that they've done to bring forward these petitions that we are considering in the House um, today and to members from across the House for their heartfelt and thorough contributions um, to this debate. I don't think there's any question that any honourable or right honourable member in this House is not acutely mindful of the enormous pressures and challenges that people feel in the current climate and it is right I think that we come together as a house and that we debate these issues we debated these issues last week we're debating these issues again today and I've got no doubt that there will be further opportunities where we will debate them going forward I just wanted to open my remarks by just setting out the picture with regard to disability benefits spending more generally because it does put this debate in a little bit of context and then I'll go on to explain the package of support that we've got in place and some of the work that is ongoing to try and be responsive to the many issues that have been raised today. It is worth saying that we will spend around 77 billion in 2023-24 on benefits to support disabled people and people with health conditions which is around 3.1% of GDP and in 2023-24 spending on PIP DLA and attendance allowance will be £12.5 billion higher in real terms than it was in 2010. And total disability benefit spending in 2007-28 is forecast to be over £39.8 uh, billion higher in real terms compared to 2010. This is despite Scottish disability spend being devolved from 2020-21. But that is not to minimise for a moment the challenges that households face in the current climate, um, particularly those households which include members who are disabled, and the difficulties and challenges that they are experiencing at this time, particularly around energy affordability and the cost of living, is very pressing. I think all of us are familiar with the key root causes of why those costs are higher. Of course, the situation in Ukraine is a significant part of that resulting in what is undoubtedly energy market volatility. And that has translated into putting households here in the UK under real strain. And as a government, and I said this last week, but I think it's important to just get this on the record again, we as ministers are not complacent about the fact that we are adamant that vulnerable energy users must be able to afford their bills and we recognise that for many of those households, there are inevitably higher costs associated with that usage. And that is why the Chancellor and the Prime Minister acted decisively to introduce the cost of living payments and the structured support um, that we have provided. That was worth over £94 billion in 2022-23. And in 2023... Um, 24, and that's an average of over £3,300 per UK household. And we've also, as has been commented upon in a number of the contributions, uprated benefits in line with inflation at 10.1%, which again I think was the right thing to do. We listened to the views of disabled people, their representative groups, members in this House, and of course constituents of ours across the country, regardless of which party we represent. And we concluded, having listened to those compelling arguments, that it was the right thing to do to uprate benefits in line with inflation in that way. I also just want to recap on the cost of living payments picture that we saw in 2022-23. Um, what we saw was um, 
the government prioritising paying cost of living payments worth up to £1,100 for some households during the 2022-23 financial year. Um, and I think, actually, as a Minister in the Department for Work and Pensions, something that we can be incredibly proud of as a department was the work that officials did to help us to make sure that that payment hit people's bank accounts. Um, and 30 million cost of living payments were paid during the course of last year, and that included 8 million households receiving up to £650 across two payments, over 8 million pensioner households. Order, order. As I said earlier, the sitting is suspended for 15 minutes for a division in the House, or if there's a, another division, 25 minutes if there's two divisions. So um, the, the sitting will be resumed later. Order. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 The proceeding is currently suspended.
The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended.
The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently
Order, order. The sitting is re resumed. The debate now may continue until 7.45. I call the Minister, Tom Persglove. Well, thank you, um, Sir Mark. And just to resume from where I got to before the interval, um, over 8 million pensioner households received an additional £300 on top of their winter fuel payments and £6 million entitled to an extra cost benefit such as personal independence payment or adult disability payment in Scotland received £150. And then there was, of course, the wider package of support during the course of the financial year, including the energy price guarantee, which capped fuel bills at £2,500 for average use. And colleagues across the House will recognise that that support has been extended until next month. The £400 off of domestic electricity bills received by every household in Great Britain, as well as the council tax reductions for bans A to D in England. And one area of support which I think is particularly important as part of our overall package is the Household Support Fund, which we extended twice, um, and including support for the devolved administrations through that package in terms of consequential funding. And that has stood at £1.5 billion since October 2021. And that is important discretionary help, which is designed very specifically to allow local authorities to work with people in their communities where there are particular needs that they have that are not necessarily able to be met through the wider structured package of support. There is that sensible discretion able to be applied on a local basis to make sure that extra support can be provided to people who need that on a case-by-case -case basis. And I happen to think that that was quite a significant um, and important part of the package of support to reflect the fact that people's circumstances are often complicated and they don't fit into neat um, boxes. When it comes to cost of living support in 2023-24, um, again, colleagues will recall the Chancellor setting out in the autumn statement our intentions around the package of support for the year ahead. Eight million low-income families will get £900 um, on means-tested benefits. Um, and as a department, my department has already delivered 99% of the first cost of living payment of £301 to the 7.3 million households in receipt of a means-tested benefit, such as universal credit. That represents payments to a value of £2.2 billion. And I'm also pleased, and actually the, the Honourable Lady for um, Motherwell and Wishaw um, suggested that not much had changed since we met last week, but one update I am able to provide for the House is that last Friday, my Honourable Friend, the Minister for Social Mobility, Youth and Progression, laid in Parliament the regulations which allow us to pay over 6.5 million people um, on an extra cost disability benefit, an additional £150. Um, those payments will land in people's bank accounts starting from the 20th of June. Again, that is important help that is being provided, and I'm pleased that we're now able to give certainty around the timetable for that. And we've also laid the regulations, which mean that pensioner households will again get an additional £300 on top of their annual winter fuel payment this winter, as they did last year. But I recognise that um, one of the elements of the uh, petition, one of the petitions, very specifically focuses on the disability cost of living payment and arguments around the adequacy of the disability cost of living payment. So I, I want to reiterate um, what I said last week about that in the debate um, that we had, because I do think actually the statistics around this are quite significant. Um, and I want to stress um, that the rationale for each of the cost of living payments is different. Um, the government's view is that it is right um, that the highest amount goes to those on means-tested benefits, given that those on the lowest incomes are most vulnerable to rises in the cost of living. Having said that, we estimate that nearly 60% of individuals who receive an extra cost disability benefit will receive additional support through the means-tested benefit payment, and over 85% will receive either or both of the means-tested and pensioner benefits, which goes in some ways to the heart of the um, debate that we are having. Um, I'd also just like to assure honourable members that we're absolutely committed to ensuring 
that disabled people and people with health conditions receive the support they need. And that's why in 2022-23, we spent nearly 69 billion in real terms on benefits to support disabled people and people with health conditions. And we will continue this throughout 23-24 by uprating disability benefits in line with last September's CPI inflation figure, as I've set out already, meaning we expect to spend around 78 billion in 2023-24, 3.1% of GDP. And by 2728, I'll gladly give way to the honourable gentleman. Really the, uh, the government support that's there, and we all acknowledge that it's there. But some of the questions that some of us asked on this side, and indeed the honourable gentleman for Blackpool uh, North and Cleveland also asked similar questions. For those that were have medical, um, um, like for instance uh, mobility scooters, uh, uh, they lift in out of a bath. Uh, their, their pumps and all the things and medical things that cost extra. Also, the Honourable Lady, the Shadow Minister, and the Honourable Member for Putney myself also asked about those who have dietary issues. In other words, there's a cost factor which is extra. Can just ask, Minister, if it's possible, please, can you tell us the monies that, have, that you've spoken about there will not get to those people who need it mostly at this time? Thank you. So I will elaborate very happily on these points, and there are a lot of points that have been raised during the course of the debate that I will directly respond to, um, but it is of course the case that we are determined that that support must get to those who need it most, um, and that underpins the entire ethos behind the package of support that is being provided, but I will come on to some of the specifics that have been raised um, in a very short while. Um, as I said earlier too, by 27-28, Total disability benefit spending is forecast to be over 41 billion higher in real terms compared to 2010-11. And in terms of spending on the extra cost disability benefits, that alone will amount to some 35 billion pounds this year, all paid tax-free in addition to any other support, financial or practical, that disabled individuals may receive. Um, but one point that I specifically wanted to deal with was the one that was raised by um, the Honourable Lady um, for Putney. And the first Thing to say is that I would be very happy to meet with her and the um, charity to which she referred. I'm always very happy to meet with colleagues. I think that colleagues would say that as a minister I am always willing to engage and that I, you know, I try my best to say yes to as many requests as possible because I think it's really important to hear um, the experiences of disabled people, um, their representative organisations, and that we have that constructive dialogue in, in the way that the Shadow Minister um, indicated was important. I completely accept that, and that is reflected um, in the work that I do and in the engagement that I have um, week to week. And so I'd be very happy to, to say yes to, to that engagement um, with her. And I hope that one thing that will um, reassure her a little bit, and she talked about um, evaluation of the cost of living payments and the adequacy of the cost of living payments. Um, I can confirm, as I did in the debate we had last week, um, that the department is planning on having um, an evaluation relating to the cost of living payments later this year. And alongside that, I'll gladly give way to the Shadow Minister. Um, it's very interesting what the Minister is saying about an evaluation. And I know that many times I've asked written parliamentary questions, I've done freedom of information requests and so forth around the government actually publishing and being open and transparent with their evaluation. So I wonder whether or not when that evaluation takes place, the Minister will commit to ensuring that it's published. I will um, very happily take away um, the Shadow Minister's request for publication um, of the evaluation. I think, but I think one thing I would say is that um, Secretary of State and I and other Ministers um, in the Department have been um, very willing I would say, to come forward and try and provide more information to the House to support the base. And she shakes her head, and I think that that's not right, because actually we have come forward, and for example, around the structural reforms with the white paper, a commitment that I have made, a decision that I have made within the department, because I think it's important for Parliament to have that information, is to provide a significant statistical release around it, so that colleagues on all sides can take a look at those reforms and reach informed decisions when it comes to there being votes on them around the specifics of the policy. And I would argue, I think that it's fair to say, there are good reasons why we are intending to pursue those policies in the way that we are. And that statistical release will allow colleagues to form their judgments. But I will happily take away the specific request um, around um, publication. And of course, there are um, very significant um, statistical releases that we provide as a department, as well as 
um, reports that are put into the public domain at the conclusion of them. We're at the early stages of beginning this work, um, but I'm really happy to look at this through that lens because I think where we can try and provide greater information um, to support parliamentary debate, to support um, those that we work with to get the packages of support right, I think it's not unhelpful um, wherever possible that we provide that information in a way um, that is accessible um, beyond the department. And the disability unit is also um, seeking to understand and evidence the full impact um, of the current cost of living on disabled people across a range of sectors. That work um, is ongoing and again there is good um, dialogue and engagement going on um, with disabled people, with their representative groups about that so that we completely are able to look at this situation in its totality, understand the interventions that we've made to date but also to understand um, the needs that exist and I think that's relevant to some of what I will just go on to say in relation to the other points that were raised um, during the debate. Um, on energy costs specifically, and of course um, it was rather helpful that we had, um, albeit for a short time, my honourable friend, the member for Derby North, um, here. Um, she was able to hear some of the debate and I will very happily relay to her um, the contributions that were made throughout the debate um, because of course it is the case that um, the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero leads on energy policy. But in terms of energy costs, um, which understandably um, many honourable members referenced, uh, particularly in relation to the cost of equipment, the government supported families across the UK last winter through the energy price guarantee, which places a limit on the price households pay per unit of gas or electricity. And as announced at the spring budget, that house, the households continue to be supported throughout the spring with the extension of the EPG at £2,500 per year for the average household until June 2023. And that will give the average British family an average saving of £160 per household throughout this period. And then there is also the support that is provided through cold weather payments and the warm homes discount. And then I just wanted to, as I did last week, just touch on um, the priority services register run by energy suppliers, which offers additional free services to people who are of pensionable age, registered disabled, have a hearing or visual impairment or have long-term ill health. This register helps to ensure that people in vulnerable situations are able to access extra help when needed, such as if there is a power cut. And with that, I'll gladly give way to the Honourable Lady. I wonder if the Minister is going to say more about warm home discount, because very I many am. of us mm. uh, in this debate raised that. Mm. And I, I have felt, um, on behalf of people who found that they couldn't get it, including people that uh, had that discount before, that this has been very harsh this winter. Mm. Um, the, the way that, that uh, people were excluded from it due to a sort of assumed characteristics of what their bills are is not acceptable. I know we had a, quite a long uh, sort of expose of, of various ideas of how to, to calculate that, but I, I the Minister will admit that the, the scheme he's adopted is, is actually pretty crude. And, and I know has left people on very low incomes in cold homes. Mm -hmm. And I really think it's, it ought to be looked at again. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm very happy to deal directly with that point. I just want to touch on energy costs and the longer term thinking that is going on around that, that of course, as I say, is led by the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. But I'll gladly give way to the Honourable Lady as well. Thank you, Madam Minister, for giving way. I just want to take him back very briefly to where he was talking about um, priority customers and for those that are elderly or disabled. Now, I mentioned in my speech the fact that accessible information isn't being provided to a number of disabled people, being it those that have a learning disability or if somebody is blind or partially sighted. So what analysis or work is his department doing, um, given that it's a legal duty on these providers to ensure that information is being provided in the right formats for people? Because there's no point in having a priority scheme if they're not actually meeting the needs of those that they are prioritising. So on that point specifically, what I will do, if I may, is to ask my honourable friend who was here earlier to provide an update to um, the honourable lady on this particular point, given that it relates to that interaction um, with the energy companies. I think it's important that she's given the opportunity to comment at that point um, in question. I also just wanted, before moving on to energy costs in the longer term, to touch on the point that the honourable lady, the member for um, Bladen, made around... 
um, water schemes. Again, I'm very happy to take that away, recognising that there is support that the energy companies provide that, that she alluded to. Um, but again, I'd be very happy to raise that with ministerial colleagues elsewhere who have responsibility directly um, for policy um, around water. And she mentioned um, Marie Curie and the work that they're doing. I would particularly like to just place on record my thanks to them, given that she touched on um, situations involving people who are at the end of life for the brilliant advocacy and campaigning and the work that they did with my department and with the officials at the DWP to help us to get the special rules for end of life changes right um, that will be a significant help to many families across the country at a time when actually they should be spending that time with their loved ones as a family and with friends and not having worries about their finances and I think that the special rules for end of life changes that have been introduced allowing that fast track help to be provided for a longer period of time is a important change that members in this house campaign for as well as um, the charitable sector and I'm really proud of the fact that we've been able to bring that forward and that that's been done in a really collaborative way and, and as I say we've had fantastic um, insight and guidance and support in helping to get that policy right and that will be helping families across the country um, today um, having been uh, brought into being a few weeks ago with that second um, tranche of benefits um, now subject to those changes and I'm really pleased to be able to say that when those applications come in they are dealt with very very quickly within a matter of days and people get um, that important help so I was grateful for the opportunity to, to just reflect on that. Um, look into the future the government recognises that we need to consider energy affordability in the longer term as part of this, the government intends to move away from universal energy bill support and towards better targeted support for those most in need. As set out in the 2022 Autumn Statement, we are working with consumer groups, charities and industry to explore possible options for a new approach to consumer protection, such as a social tariff from April 2024 onwards as part of <coughs> Of wider retail market reforms and actually there is as well just to add to that point engagement ongoing um, between ministers and with disabled people's organizations and their representative groups um, to understand what that might look like and to make sure that those views are included as we look to um, that work and this work includes um, thorough engagement around that with disability organizations considering the costs for people with medical equipment and assessing the potential need for specific support for vulnerable and disabled people using energy intensive medical equipment in the home. This new approach will be aligned to our objectives to deliver a fair deal for consumers to ensure that the energy market is resilient and attractive to investors over the long term and to support an efficient and flexible energy system. Any new approach will also need to promote competition within the energy markets and be consistent with our wider objectives to improve energy security and deliver net zero. And just while I'm on that particular point, um, on this specific issue of medical equipment, um, it is fair to say that we are looking at this um, on a cross-government basis. And I know, for example, that the Department of Health and Social Care and NHS England are supporting the Department of Energy security and net zeros review of energy rebates and refund schemes that are currently available for users of medical equipment at home and they're also supporting the department's policy development work in this area which they plan to publish for low-income vulnerable energy consumers post April 2024. Um, I also understand um, that there are arrangements in place involving um, specialised NHS services and integrated care boards which will of course no doubt want to consider carefully as part of that wider um, landscape as we move forward around the energy um, reforms that I've described. Um, and when it comes to those market reforms, I'll, I'll gladly give way to. Costs for machinery. It seems there are uh, different understandings about what is available and how well known it is. And I wonder whether the work that's currently being done will ensure that it's widely known and widely uh, available to people who need this essential equipment? Again, I think as we, we had quite a good debate about awareness um, last week, and one of the things I undertook to do was to go away and see what more we can do um, to increase awareness. And that's why I think the engagement 
um, is really important, actually, and why having such thorough engagement, including um, disabled people and their representative bodies, is so key. Because what we want to do is to make sure that um, these reforms reflect um, their views, their experiences, their needs. Um, and I would say that the awareness piece is absolutely fundamental in all of that, to make sure that people are aware properly of the support um, that is available to them. And with that in mind, as set out in the Energy Security Plan released in March, the Government intends to consult on options for this new approach this summer. We will invite and welcome the public and our stakeholders to use this consultation to feed back on our proposals. And to specifically deal with the warm home discount question, I'll, I'll gladly give way to you. Further to the point of the Honourable Member for Braden made, I'm, I'm just wondering, Minister, um, how the, who quantifies or, or decides what the amount of electricity is used or energy is used by someone with a medical device? Um, is, that, uh, is there an input from the charity into that there, from the organisations themselves, just to make sure that when it comes to, to agreeing a figure, which I welcome, by the way, the fact that Minister is uh, indicating that's going to be the case, who will agree what the final figure will be? So I entirely recognise the challenge of identifying that figure because inevitably people's circumstances differ, which is exactly why, as I explained earlier, we introduced, for example, the discretionary household support fund to try and aid some of that and to make sure that there was that discretionary support um, in place within the wider landscape of um, help that we've made available in order to capture those um, circumstances. I can't give him a specific figure today but again, I just go back to the point that this is precisely why the engagement piece is so important around this. And I think these are issues that we are no doubt going to want to explore during the conversations we have to work out precisely what it is um, that people need, what that average cost looks like, and then how those costs that are above that average level might best be met. And there are also variables at play in relation to this. Um, we, we talked about how um, the situation in Ukraine has played into these higher costs that people are experiencing, um, particularly around energy, and inevitably, and all of us hope, um, that that conflict um, will come to an end in short order. Um, but the timings around that and the nature of that conflict play into the levels at which those costs then come through and the way in which they are presented um, to people here um, in the UK, reflected in the energy bills um, that then turn up through their letterboxes um, or on their emails that they're then um, often worried about and, of course, are having to find the money um, to pay. So these are issues that we are going to need to look at really carefully, but we're also going to have to do that in a way that tracks the current nature of the um, energy market as a result of um, what is going on in the world. Um, and I think it probably speaks as well to why the Prime Minister's determination to get inflation down is so fundamental and why I as a minister and his government absolutely support him in his determination to try and tackle inflation as best we are able because again this all plays into um, these costs that people um, are experiencing. I just wanted to touch on the warm home discount scheme um, that has been um, raised and we reformed the scheme in England and Wales to provide more rebates automatically and focus the support to households in fuel poverty and on the lowest incomes. As the overall funding for the scheme is limited, we focus support towards those on the lowest incomes, those who receive means-tested benefits. Disability benefits are not means-tested. Overall, our analysis showed that 160,000 more households where a person is disabled or has a long-term illness would receive a rebate. And in addition, the proportion of rebates received by households with a disability or long-term illness would remain higher than the proportion of the fuel-poor population with a disability or and higher than the proportion of the overall population with a disability. Um, but again, there have been views expressed during the course of this debate um, that I will happily take away and reflect on as we move forward and again make sure that ministers um, elsewhere in government are aware of them. And then in relation to prepayment metres, which was also touched on um, very briefly, Ofgem published a new code of practice on the 18th of April this has been agreed with energy suppliers to improve protections for customers being moved to a prepayment meter involuntarily. Um, this is, of course, a step in the right direction, with better protections for vulnerable households 
um, but the code of practice is not the end of this process. And we've always been clear that action is needed to crack down on the practice of forcing people onto prepayment meters, especially the most vulnerable, and the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero will continue to work closely with Ofgem and industry to see that the code leads to positive changes for vulnerable consumers and won't hesitate to intervene again if necessary. And I've got no doubt um, that if we um, do not see um, the progress that we want to see on this, um, that we will have more debates in this House around that particular issue that I know is of real concern to people having seen um, egregious cases reported upon in the media, but also um, reflected in our inboxes as constituency MPs. I also wanted to say something about energy efficiency, because the best way of protecting households is by lowering the cost of the energy that we consume and reducing the volumes that we use. Um, this means taking further steps on energy efficiency. Um, this government has set a new and ambitious target to reduce final energy demand from buildings and industry by 15% by 2030 and has created the new energy efficiency task force that is charged with driving improvements that will bring down energy bills for households and businesses. Based on proposals announced last year as ECO Plus, our new Energy Companies Obligation Scheme will deliver £1 billion of additional investment by March 2026 in energy efficiency upgrades, such as loft and cavity wall insulation. It will extend help to a wider group of households in the least efficient homes, in the lower council tax bands, as well as boosting help for those on the lowest incomes. I'll gladly give way to you. You're absolutely right to talk about energy efficiency in one context, but on the other hand, to truly, really acknowledge that disabled people face additional energy cost bills because of their disability. So it's not, you know, energy efficiency is one thing, but really it's about addressing the challenge that is faced by disabled people right now in relation to cost of living, but also energy costs also. So I entirely accept that, and I don't think that I've suggested otherwise but of course where we can help in, a, in the totality in the whole with the energy costs that people experience we should do that and I think it is right that as government we do our bit to try and help through those schemes to provide um, that insulation support which does in, inevitably assist with some of those challenging costs that we're then dealing with um, through the wider support that, that I've described and we plan to lay legislation by the summer um, to take forward um, those measures that, that I've just set out. And energy efficiency measures in the fabric of our buildings, such as loft and cavity wall insulation, will lead to less demand on the electricity and gas grids, which in turn could help us mitigate the impact of high and volatile international gas prices. This could also reduce energy bills for consumers, as well as help vulnerable households out of fuel poverty. And just finally, I wanted to say something about the proposed white paper reforms that we came forward as a government and set out um, six or so weeks ago. Um, I think it's absolutely right that we unlock the potential of those who wish to work and to do that with the right support. And, and I'm mentioning this because there's been a few um, comments in relation to it. And um, I was able to say that we will be um, providing that statistical release, which I think will um, give colour to those reforms and, and allow people to make um, judgments um, about them and understand the rationale for why we're proposing to take this in the direction that we are. But I regularly hear from disabled people who would like the opportunity to work, um, but that structural barrier within the system, that worry, that jeopardy about trying work, it not working out, and then having to go back through reapplication and reassessment processes just cannot be right. And that undoubtedly is getting in the way of so many people um, unlocking that potential and taking on that work if that's something that they want to do. And the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Strangford, touched on opportunities for part-time work. This is exactly the sort of opportunity that we want to unlock for people um, and getting rid of that jeopardy that people feel is in the system and undoubtedly that work opportunity will help with household resilience when it comes to costs that they experience more generally and he, he asked specifically about what sort of support we're putting in place around that 
Um, for example, the announcement the Chancellor made around universal support, which um, the pioneers for that are the individual placement and support and primary care, which we know works. It has a 68% success rate with that supported employment model of identifying an employment opportunity that is right for someone and then supporting them into that role and then helping them to retain it. And, skill and, and schemes like Access to Work Plus, I also think are really exciting and have a great opportunity. Um, we're currently evaluating um, some of our initial testing of that, but what that is all about, it is about crafting a job role, working with an employer that is keen to take on a disabled person to make sure um, that they are able to um, unlock that opportunity and to craft the role in a way that is right for that individual and to work very much with them on a tailored, personalised basis, which is exactly the basis um, that I am determined that we will progress um, those white paper reforms on. Um, with that <coughs> overarching sentiment and that fundamental safety net that we would never ask anyone to do something that is inappropriate for them. And alongside that, we also want to... Um, see a better journey through the benefit system for people who need that support. Um, I am not complacent about this. There have been um, contributions today that have touched on uh, PIP journey times. I can confirm that the current situation is that those journey times are down to 14 <coughs> weeks. Um, that is where we wanted to get to. Um, previously, there were um, unacceptable waits, I would argue, that people were experiencing but I also am being stretching with officials about what more we can do to try and take that further and to try and get that certainty for people as early in that journey as possible and I think some of the measures that we talked about in the white paper um, speak to the wider effort that we want to make to try and improve those experiences of the benefit system the severe disability group um, for example where I hope to be able to say more about the work that we're going to do to really try and kick that on and test that uh, model that we think is right that reduces that assessment burden on people particularly where their conditions are very unlikely to improve um, I would argue that scrapping the work capability assessment is a very good opportunity and we've had many debates in this house over the years um, and I often think back to debates before my time here but that was a very controversial issue and I think that scrapping the work capability assessment is the right thing to do and it allows us an opportunity to really focus in on quality decision making over and above um, the current picture. We want to better gauge fluctuating conditions within the benefit system and we want to test that to see what we can do to provide better quality support and help for people navigating the benefit system with fluctuating conditions. As well as that piece of feedback that came through loud and clear from people in the Green Paper consultation response where they said we want to see the department matching expert assessors with our particular condition because we think that that will lead to better outcomes with a greater understanding around that. So I'm looking forward to the opportunities um, to debate these issues in the, and these opportunities in the, in the weeks and months ahead, and I'll gladly give way to the Honourable Lady. The Minister was winding to his last few sentences. I didn't want us to leave this debate without raising again uh, my thanks to carers and the We Care campaign who've done such a wonderful job. He hasn't mentioned carers much, which is disappointing, mm. given that this was, this was uh, carers were mentioned such a lot. And I think we should be very grateful, because he talked about um, people who wanted to get back into work, people with disabilities wanted to get back into work, and that's admirable. But we ought to be constantly thankful for the hundreds of thousands of people who mm. have given up work so that they can care, and we owe them a massive debt. And I don't think, I, I think I'm right in saying that his government has not done anything like as much work as previous governments have made on carers. They don't have a carer's strategy, a national carer strategy anymore, which we did under previous governments. And it's a pity that have, it having been raised with him so many times during this debate, he hasn't mentioned it more. Well, I haven't finished my remarks yet, and I think it's important to um, say thank you to carers who do do a remarkable job and who provide incredible support, often to loved ones and family members and friends. Um, and I recognise that for carers, often that is really challenging. Um, and that is why we do provide um, the support that we do through Carers Allowance. And actually, again, the Honourable Lady wasn't in the debate that we had last week. A commitment that I made there was to go away and look at um, Carers Allowances and the thresholds, because I know that this is an issue that is being raised um, fairly regularly now in the context of the debates that we have around these issues. And that is a commitment that I repeat 
again today. I want to see whether the balance is right in relation to um, carers' allowance, but whether there may be more that we can do um, around that. Father Giveaway. Um, I would just like to add the needs of young carers to this conversation and if, if those conversations going forward could also add the needs of young carers and there is a young carers or party parliamentary group we've heard very powerfully from young carers as I have from my own constituents and those rem the remarks on the, the reduced delays for the, the payments uh, it's welcome to go from 18 weeks to 14 weeks but that's still only over three months rent that's still unaffordable for many people that they will really uh, often lose homes have to um, give up many opportunities and it's very crippling. I've been to the National Assessment Centre for PIP um, and I don't know what the barrier is. I don't know why it's coming down further, why it can't be streamlined. I wonder if the Minister could say what it is that's stopping it coming down any further and, and is there a, a target date of how many weeks that's been set to the National PIP Assessment Centre as well? So where we are is, is at the moment um, the journey time for PIP is 14 weeks. And the situation, um, and I'll, I'm very happy to provide her with some more information around this separately, and I'll, I'll gladly write to um, do that. But the whole thrust of the reforms that we are seeking to introduce are all about trying to get those journey times down as much as possible, trying to get more decisions right um, first time. Um, because I think all of us would want to see greater certainty for people um, as quickly as possible. And I am very keen to hear um, people's experiences and expertise about how we can best do that. That is precisely why the tests and trials um, were included um, within that um, white paper package. I think when you bring the package together as a holistic set of reforms, it is undoubtedly the largest welfare reform um, that we've seen for over a decade, but we've got to get it right because there's such an opportunity here. Um, and I really hope that over the course of the coming weeks, months and years, we can have a constructive debate in this House about how we take those forward. And I think that would be a valuable insight as we progress with that work. Gladly give way. I, I thank the Minister for, for giving way. Can we just, can he elaborate just a bit more on why um, personal independence payment, we all know that it's an extra cost benefit, but he wants, under the, the proposals in the, the white paper, um, they are seeking to use that assessment framework uh, almost like a replacement to the WCA. Now, as, as we've all highlighted, every, we've called for it to be scrapped for years, and we're really pleased that the government finally have listened to disabled people, the opposition, and others. But does he recognise that PIP is an extra cost element of support, therefore using it to try and replace an income replacement form of social security can't be right? The feedback that um, we hear time and time again is that people want to see the assessment burden considerably reduced. Um, and I think that I would like to hope that all of us can rally around and say that we think that that is the right thing to do to then respond to that feedback and act upon it. I'm not envisaging fundamental change to the PIP assessment being required. Um, but again, what we will do within the new system, and we'll come forward with more detail about the specifics and the mechanics of how that will work, is to see um, greater um, tailoring, greater opportunity to work with people to understand what their needs are, what their aspirations are, what their requirements are, um, where work is appropriate to work with people to try and explore um, that work outcome. I think things like universal support are important as part of that. I think things like IPSPC are important as part of that. I think the additional work coach time commitment that we've made that has just gone live in the second third of job centres and will go um, live in very short order in the final third um, are really important in helping to set out the direction of travel that we are looking to take and, and give a, a, a feel for the system that will be in place. But we obviously require primary legislation to deal with that fundamental challenge, which is the jeopardy that people feel within the current system around try and work, it not working out, then having to go back through reassessment and um, reapplication processes, which is highly undesirable, and it's right that we address that. But I'm not anticipating there being um, fundamental reform to um, the PIP assessment. And I just wanted to add a little bit more um, on carers before um, concluding, because it, it was a theme that came up consistently during the course of um, the debate. And we are focusing support 
on those carers who need it most. And around 380,000 carer households on UC can already receive around £2,000 extra through the carer element. Where a household is in receipt of UC with a carer element, they will be entitled to up to £900 in cost of living payments. And if the disabled person lives in the same household, a £150 disability cost of living payment. For carers who can undertake some part-time work, we increase the carer's allowance earnings limit to £139 a week from April. But I hear the arguments that the um, Honourable Lady makes um, in relation to this. As I say, I made a commitment last week that I would go away and, and really think hard about um, those thresholds and the levels at which um, they're set within the wider context of these debates, but also the um, structural reforms and the wider um, picture. I think undoubtedly in some circumstances as well, COVID and, and the learning from COVID and opportunities for people around work are perhaps markedly different than they were um, prior to the pandemic and different people's care and responsibilities will take a different form. Um, but fundamentally, I'm, I'm very willing to, to have a look at that, um, that issue. And again, there is a lot of um, cross-government work going on um, around a whole host of issues relating to disabled people and people with health conditions, and I'd be very willing to um, raise her wider points with um, DHSC colleagues um, through those forums as well. And I think it's with that in mind, actually, that I agree um, with what my honourable friend, the member for Blackpool North, said when he made the point that um, there's actually a lot more consensus, I think, in these debates than often is given credit for. I think all of us want to see the same outcome, which is that people are properly supported, that they receive um, the help that they need to get them through these difficult times. As I said earlier, I think it is right that the Prime Minister wants our government to focus on getting inflation down. That undoubtedly is playing a significant part in these costs that people are experiencing. We've been responsive to date in terms of the support that we've provided, but our minds are not closed. We continue to engage and we will continue to keep under review the package of support. And I think there are some really important measures coming down the track where there is a lot of opportunity um, for colleagues and disabled people and their organisations to help influence that and to make sure that we get it right. So thank you, Minister. Um, I now call on Marsha de Dover uh, to wind up the debate if she wishes to do so. Uh, thank you, Sir Mark. Can I just start very briefly by thanking all of our uh, speakers. It has been a, a good debate. Um, and my honourable friend and neighbour, as a member for Putney, Canterbury, Worsley and Eccles South, <coughs> Blayton, Strangford, Oldham East and Saddleworth, Eastern Bartonshire, Blackpool, North and Cleveland for, for all of their, their contributions. Um, the minister outlined a lot in his response, a, a, a lot of work that he's looking into or taking back or work is is being done but what has been overwhelming in this debate is that disabled people actually need support now um, and any further delay isn't going to help them and if he hasn't look, read the re survey responses can I ask him to, to please take some time to read them because that really signifies the urgency um, of, of this debate it signifies the urgency in terms of the support that disabled people need and that they are currently facing. And I did highlight in my speech, it is on the back of 13 years of austerity and a hostile environment that unfortunately his government um, created, compounded by the uh, pandemic and now the cost of living crisis. So whilst I appreciate some of his words, it's really important that he takes, it, takes, the, takes this on board. Um, Areas like the uh, warm homes discount, everybody has mentioned that. But, you know, your own assessment, impact assessment, highlighted that nearly 300,000 disabled people were going to lose out. What about those people? We didn't hear anything about how you are going, we are going to support those people. Um, but, you know, it, essentially, um, we all know the challenges that disabled people um, are facing. And I, I would just hope... Um, that the government would use this as an opportunity to think hard uh, and think fast, frankly, and bring forward some proposals that will provide immediate financial support. He also um, had, didn't acknowledge the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People that was signed by the last Labour government and will be implemented, but will, why won't his government seek to implement that now? 
given that they no longer have any strategy in place to support disabled people. Um, I also want to finally um, thank our petitioners, uh, Katie and Abigail, who are actually here this afternoon for their tireless hard work, but also for sharing their own experiences. Um, I, I know the challenges that you face um, and the difficulties um, in terms of what your disability mean, does to you to, to live out a daily life and to live independently. Um, so thank you once again. And I suppose the final point I would say, when we are looking at disability minister, it is about the social model of disability as opposed to looking at it in a medical context. If you think about it from a social model perspective, then you'll recognise that it is some of the societal barriers that need to be broken down that will enable disabled people to live an independent life and their human rights are preserved. Thank you, Chair. So the question is that this House has considered e-petition 610300 and 617425 relating to the cost of living and financial support for disabled people. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order, the sitting stands adjourned. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.